All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Let me try to um, join another chat room real quick. Um, no, OK. So I hope you all can see my screen properly. Um, I'm sorry for my voice being a little shitty. Um, that's because I'm sick with allergies. Um, so I hope it won't be too bad. Thank you all so much uh, for joining today. I hope you've already had a fun Android makers. Um, and I know you probably have heard this sentence like a thousand times already, um, but this is also super new for me. I've never ever done this before and it feels a little weird. So let's see how it goes. My name is Yossi Wolf and I do Android at Snap Mobile. And um, today I'll be talking about experimenting with a Kotlin compiler, which is something I usually like would never have done. Um, so last year I was working on a project where we were building an SDK for a client and I had never ever actually built an SDK before. Um, and I learned a lot. And like one of the things I learned was, um, I want to show you a doc picture before we totally dive in because this will be a complicated talk. Um, one of the things I learned is that SDKs really should be simple. Um, so that means in our case, it meant that the SDK should only have one entry point. So for everything in our SDK, uh, in this example, the chat SDK, we would only want to call the chat SDK class and nothing else. We wouldn't want to have like a chat SDK class and a user SDK class because it would be kind of hard to use. So um, say we wanted to implement a message feature what we would do is let the chat SDK class implement the message feature. Now that works, but as things get more complicated kind of, um, and as you add more features, say a user feature, a picture feature, whatever, it gets kind of cluttered. Um, and you're not really able to maintain that class. And it's just something you don't want to have in your code base. So, I found out that like Kotlin actually has this very, very nice, nice feature, which can help you with that. So say you were to extract all this code that we just added for the implementation, just into another class. So say there was another class called simple messenger. It implements the message feature. Now we're able to use that class with something called class delegation or inheritance by delegation in Kotlin. So basically what we can say is we want to implement the interface message feature by the instance of simple messenger. So what that does under the hood um, in terms of generation is generate, right? Um, this is what the decompiled bytecode would look like. First it generates a class, which is called chat SDK and it implements the interface. And then it generates a synthetic field. So it th since that synthetic field is something which, you know, cannot be accessed by anything, by anything else at runtime, it's just kind of artificially there and it's created by the Kotlin compiler. And it starts with two dollar signs. Um, a dollar sign at the start is a good indicator that it's a synthetic field. Um, so as you can see, it's fairly simple. It's just, a field which holds an instance of this simple messenger like we had it in the constructor before. So now what the Kotlin compiler will generate for us is this small helper code, which is adding the, um, adding the method contract to the chat SDK class and then just calling the delegate and like delegating the method call. This is super, super awesome because it helps you avoid a lot of unneeded boilerplate code. Um, and it's a feature I really, really love. And it's a feature I wanted to use, but uh, turns out I couldn't really because there were some limitations to it. Um, so, so, sorry. Um, technical difficulties. So, um, I love this feature, but it has some limitations. For example, you're only able to access 
at this point, um, instances from the, or properties from the primary constructor. Um, so if you wanted to access this message feature delegate later on and do something with it, uh, you couldn't right now because class delegation just doesn't work that way and it's not designed to be that way. So what, what would I do, someone who has apparently too much time? Find out that Kotlin is open source. Um, I mean, this might be known to a lot of you, but turns out uh, Kotlin is open source and you can just go and download the source code from GitHub. You can just git clone it um, and then you got it on your machine. So basically what I did was like go, okay, so class delegation doesn't work the way I want it to. So what if I just try to make it work the way I want it to? Um, so first step I really want to call out is, right, I, I, cloned, I cloned the GitHub repository, I cloned the Git repository, and then I got to work with it. Number one is to build Kotlin, you actually need different JDK versions. Like you need JDK versions ranging from, I think JDK 1.6 to 1.9. You need to all install them all side by side, which can be a bit of a pain. So be aware that you need to do that. Um, there's also some details about that listed in the Kotlin repository readme. So after trying around and finally getting to install some different JDK versions side by side, I managed to open up Kotlin in IntelliJ, which is like, I mean, just fairly, fairly simple, just as any other project you would go and open it. There is some more detailed instructions in the Kotlin repository as well. So as you see, this is a huge, huge, huge project. Like on the left, all the modules that are there. I mean, there's like so many more of them. Um, I guess it's like a 60 or 70 or 80 modules probably. And they all have a lot of code. And it made me realize that, wow, Kotlin and its compiler turns out it's actually quite complicated. Um, so, I wanted to run Kotlin. I wanted to like actually do something with it. Right now I have the code in IntelliJ, but I wanted to actually do something with it. So running it is actually not as hard as I thought it would be as well. Basically when you clone the Kotlin project, um, it provides you with run and debug configurations and you can just select some of them. Um, there's idea, which basically just runs, builds a version of IntelliJ IDEA with the um, Kotlin version bundled in with your Kotlin source code bundled in. Um, and then you can basically make changes to Kotlin locally in your source code. Um, and then you can run an IntelliJ IDEA instance, which has it bundled in and you can like directly test all your changes, which is super nice. As you see, there's also some other configurations, um, so you can really test quite a bit. Um, so running running uh, IntelliJ IDEA looks like this, basically. Uh, so you can, it's really just like any other IntelliJ instance, you will get, uh, you, you'll be able to run uh, and create a new project and create Java files, Kotlin files, whatever you want. So. It's really just like a normal IntelliJ IDEA instance. So the Kotlin compiler, this whole huge thing. So it's more kind of a black box um, than I initially thought it would be. And I thought it makes sense to give you a little overview of what the Kotlin compiler actually is. So basically, right, the compiler takes some KT files and it produces bytecode. Um, that's the really simple version of it. And it's fine if you wanna stick with that explanation. I wanna dive into it a little, little more. Um, so I see that basically none of you have real experience with the Kotlin or with any compiler, 
which is the same as me before starting this. So I've never actually done anything regarding compilers. I didn't have any class in uni about compilers. So I was totally dumbfounded. Um, so this is all new for me. Um, so diving into how the Kotlin compiler is structured, right? It says blue box here. I think it's rather a black box because one thing I learned really quickly about the Kotlin compiler is there's basically no documentation on it. I was talking to some IntelliJ and JetBrains people about it and they were like, well, yeah, sorry, we don't have any documentation, which is quite bad if you've ever worked on a project without documentation. And then if you see the scale of the Kotlin compiler. Um, so it's a huge kind of experiment. Um, basically the Kotlin compiler as any compiler has three main components. Number one is the lexer. So basically what a lexer does is it takes the source code that you give it and it tokenizes them. So it tokenizes the source code. So basically it takes the words you give them like class, my class or data class, my home state, and it breaks them up into tokens. And it's like, okay, class is a keyword. And then my class would be a name of the class. Um, and it does some, does some grammar validation. Then you got the parser and I want to take a quick look into what the parser does. Um, after, after this, so sorry. Um, and then as a final step, you have the code generation. So let's talk about the parser for a little bit. Um, there's two main components in there. The parser basically analyzes the syntax after it gets the tokens from the lecture and it creates an AST. Um, AST stands for abstract syntax tree and it's basically a representation of that kind of syntax and of the elements that's within the Kotlin compiler. Um, and then it passes that on to the semantic analyzer. So what's AST? I don't want to dive into like computer science theory too much here, just like give a basic explanation. So if you had source code like this, which is like, so you have a function with two annotations on top of it, um, the abstract syntax tree for it lo would look like this. So package header and import list are not super important for us right now. You would see there is a declaration for the function parse. Um, and then there's a declar there's the annotation for annotation one, and it has an argument, which is the string ABC, as you see right here. Um, and then for annotation two, which has some more complex string, there is um, also the class annotation with arguments and then an escaped string. So basically this abstract syntax tree is just something which Kotlin works with, with uh, that the compiler works with that like I think every programming language has um, is like an internal representation of the source code. Um, so it's in a stage in compilation. So the parser takes that AST um, and on top of it, it creates a PSI. Now this is another, you know, another word which I don't really want to dive into too deep because it's such a more complex topic. Um, PSI stands for Program Structure Interface. And you don't have to understand this graphic. This is just to show you how complex it can be. Um, this is taken from the IntelliJ documentation. So this is why I'm not diving into the PSI too much right now. Um, so the last step after the compiler um, has run the lecture and tokenized everything, created an abstract syntax tree and creating, created a program structure interface on top of that as the code generation. Um, so it takes this PSI um, and generates a code with that. So there's two main components in the Kotlin code gen, um, Kotlin compiler code generation, which first is the intermediate code generator. So really basically just generates um, 
the code, which is not optimized at all. And then there is a code optimizer, right? Which takes that code and it optimizes everything. Um, so those can be categorized into front end and back end. Um, so front end is really just like what the what the user actually sees, what the developer actually sees uh, when using Kotlin, and the back end is what kind of right what lies underneath um, what you won't actually get to see when using Kotlin normally. So this is just like a really really brief kind of overview on such a complex and hard topic. And if you didn't get anything. If you didn't understand everything, that's totally fine. You don't need to for, for following on, but I wanted to have a brief overview of what the hell the theory and components this is actually made up of. So I, without any compiler knowledge really, or with just this basic compiler knowledge that we just heard set out to modify Kotlin in a way that I wanted it to. So looking back at like code that we would write, right? Um, so I wanted to modify the way this works. Um, I wanted to be able to access this delegate. And I was like, so how the hell do I do it? Um, so this, what you see right here, is not the slide I wanted. This, what you see right here, is the constructor header and the super type list, which I'll get back to in a second. So it was like, how the hell do I actually change something about this? And maybe some of you know KEEPS. KEEPS stands for Kotlin Enhancement Evolution Proposal or Process. Um, and basically KEEPS allow you to propose a change to the Kotlin programming language and uh, discuss about it. So it's a GitHub repository, which can be found, uh, which can be found at github.com slash Kotlin slash keep. Um, and so we searched a bit and I found this keep proposal, which is called implementation by delegation enhancements. Um, and basically it discussed a proposal for those delegation enhancements exactly what I wanted. And then I looked at it and I was like, okay, it was opened in September, 2018. There's 84 comments, which is quite a bit, but it just became stale at some point and nobody replied anymore. Um, so the way keeps work is you open an issue, you discuss with other people, and then, um, if you're lucky, you get a shepherd from JetBrains, which basically takes care of making, of implementing it and pushing it in the project internally. Um, this just didn't happen for this keep. So I was like, okay, whatever. If you're not gonna react to this keep, I'm just gonna like try it myself just for giggles and laughs. Um, so the first starting point to anything really is the Kotlin Lang Slack. There are some really good resources in there and you get direct contact to JetBrains people. And there is specifically the language design channel. So if you wanna propose anything, you'd first go there, propose it, and then um, on feed, acting from feedback on from others, you would uh, open up a key. Now, this was like going back to, going back to what I actually wanted to do I thought about what I wanted it to look like really. Um, and I thought about, okay, I wanna be able to reference members in the constructor header. Um, and they probably should be specifically marked in some, in some way. Um, so I thought, what about like a class delegate uh, keyword? Um, so, what this enables you to do basically is use it later on. For example, you could swap out the implementation, which could be super, super useful, or you could add some more logic to the simple messenger um, and you could call it later on. So there's some really, really useful things this would enable. 
Um, so I thought, how do I do it? Um, and I, I found late in it and I was like, okay, late in it sounds kind of, sounds kind of similar in terms of like what it does because late in it is a modifier. Um, so I was like, okay, I want to have, I want to have a modifier, um, which is called class delegate. How do I do it? Um, and the first thing after finding that out, I did was go into, uh, go into the Kotlin project and just CMD shift and F and search everywhere for late in it. And this was like the super, super naive approach because I didn't like find any good resources on anything on how the Kotlin compiler works. And it was kind of painful, but, um, after a while I found this, I found this mysterious file, which is called KT tokens.java. And basically it has all the tokens, all the tokens from, um, Kotlin in there. For example, the late in a keyword and the data keyword and the inline keyword, or it has a semicolon and colon and so on. So basically just any token from the Kotlin programming language is stored in there. This is basically uh, what the Lexer uses um, to recognize that, hey, this is actually like valid Kotlin that you're allowed to write. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like add add a keyword here called class delegate keyword. It's a soft keyword modifier um, named class delegate, right? That should do what I want. Um, and it turns out it wasn't actually that wrong. It was a good first step because now I was able to write class delegate for messenger, um, which was nice, but it, right, it didn't actually do anything. I just added a keyword to call it. So after finally finding out how to add a keyword through the KT tokens file, um, I set out to actually make this work or try to make it work. Um, so there needed to be some code generation part, um, which just made this work in some magic way, which I didn't know how it would work, but I was sure I would find out. Um, so again, I just want to remind you in terms of like the comp compilation stages, the code generation is just at the end after the Lexer and parser have done their work and you get like a good, good full implement, you get full information on the source code and you get a nice complex um, and full representation um, of what the source code looks like in PSI. So programming structure interface. Um, so my first thing that I did was search around and think a bit. And finally I, I realized, oh, Hey, what I'm doing has to do with the primary constructor. So first I realized, okay, it has to do with the constructor or something. Um, and then I realized, okay, it has to do with a primary constructor. And I just searched for a bit and specifically I was looking for something with the constructor header. Um, this red marking is also, um, is also the super type list. Um, so you can see that, right? The super type of chat SDK would be message feature implements that. Um, so I set out again with my, um, search everywhere strategy, which is, I guess, a very naive strategy, but it worked out in the end. Um, and frankly, given the black box, the Kotlin compiler is, I don't know if there's any better strategy right now, unless JetBrains adds some more documentation. So I set out and I found this file, which is called constructor code generation .java. Um, and it, it did a lot of things like basically took care it takes care of generating everything related to constructors. So generating the primary constructor itself, generating the secondary constructor, generating the primary constructor implementation and secondary constructor implementation. And it was kind of hard to like see through what the hell was actually going on. 
Um, so I want to remind you of what I'm, I was trying to do because, right, this is a lot of things. So looking at this code, what happens is the Kotlin compiler creates or generates a synthetic field. Um, and it initializes it as well, which is something we actually don't want um, because we're trying to reference it um, in some way. We don't want it to point to just an instance, but we want it to point to another uh, to another field, right? So what that looks like, um, wait, I'm so sorry. So what we would try to do instead is we would want to write like our nicer, our nicer implementation, right? Chat SDK, which implements message feature interface by messenger. And the messenger is a field within the chat SDK class. So what we would want this generated code to look like basically is that it doesn't like point to the instance of new sim of simple messenger. So we wouldn't want to have new simple messenger in there, but we want to have it point to our field, which is messenger. Um, that way we can change things later on. And this is a very kind of naive implementation, but it works. So that's a step forward. Um, so I was looking at the code of the constructor code generation and I was trying to make sense of it and I hope I can explain it in some way that makes sense because it's kind of hard to understand. So the steps that kind of goes through, um, is first it generates the delegate expressions in code that looks like this. So step number one is it generate, it, it gets the super type list entries. Um, so the super type list, this is our super type list. Um, so message feature, right? Um, and it kind of goes through that because you might be able to, uh, you might have um, multiple super types, right? You might implement multiple, uh, multiple interfaces at once. Um, so then it kind of goes through all of that, all of those in entries in the list and it checks, is it a, KT delegated super type entry. Um, so it takes a look, um, it only acts on those because only for those something has to be generated. Um, and then it calls generate call to delegator by expression specifier. Um, so as you see, the code is kind of hard to read, but basically um, what that does, gen call to delegator by expression specifier is exactly is exactly what we don't want. Everything is slow. This right here, right? So this is what it does, and that is what we kind of need to change, which is some good information already. Um, so right now, in the original version of Kotlin, after doing that, um, it generates the fields. Um, it looks like this. It's a lot, you don't have to understand the code, but it's basically, it just generates all the fields that are there for the primary constructor. Um, and after that, it generates the member initializers, um, which is also just uh, the, it's the initializer that we just saw. Um, so after really just, I was trying around desperately with lots of lots of stuff, I realized, okay, so looking looking at this kind of order, number one, gel generate delegate expressions, and after that, the fields, and after that, the initializers, I realized that if I swap the generation of fields and this generation of the delegate expressions, it would first generate the field itself, uh, so the synthetic delegate field, and after that, it would generate the delegate expression, um, which would basically allow me to, instead of pointing to an instance, point to another field. Um, so most of the things I did in the end, like the main thing to make it work like I want to, um, was really, my slides are 
in a different order. Um, wow, so sorry. Um, let me go back a couple of slides. Right, so most of the things I did really is um, swap the order that this happens in. So first to generate the fee, uh, first to generate the field instead of the delegate expression. Um, so I could really just point to another field in the delegate expression. So it turns out that actually works, which is a little crazy. Um, and the code then it generates basically looks like this. So if you had some code like this with the class delegate var um, in there right now, and you point it to the messenger uh, for the for the delegation, the code that it generates right now would look like this. So um, if you take a look at the poll method, it points to this, the messenger.poll. And if you take a look at the push method, it takes a, uh, it points to this messenger dot push. So it's basically exactly what we want, although it's done in a kind of like crazy and little hacky feeling way. Um, so one thing I did not mention yet is when you look at the source code for what I actually did, you will have to make the uh, fields late in it uh, to work with class delegate. Mm, just because they're in, initialized later on because of the swapping that we did. So I wanna point out that it obviously wasn't as easy as this, what I just showed. I mean, this wasn't everything and everything would not fit into one talk or probably two talks uh, because that brings uh, a lot of concepts with it. Basically, Here's a list of what I what I modified, and you don't have to like read through all of it. But um, I hooked into I hooked into all of the different stages. PSI, where I added the tokens, then a lot in resolution to make it work with the with autocomplete, and then code generation, right, which is like the actual magic part. But then also some stuff in the uh, IR, which is the intermediate representation uh, in the code generation phase. Then some more stuff in the back end um, for descriptors, which are basically the models. Then I did some serialization adjustments, debugger tinkering, and scripting adjustments. So this was actually a lot of, lot of work. Um, and it was a little crazy. And the story kind of does not end in a nice way because the nice thing that I would have wished for would have been that, you know, maybe based on based on the work I did, we could open open a prototype pull request or something in Kotlin, which could be refined or something. So I pinged Andre Breslov about this, which is the lead language designer of Kotlin, and I talked to him. I was like, so, hey, what do you think? And he was like, well, you know, well, it kind of is a little too hacky. Um, and it turns out that Kotlin class delegation just is designed in a way where it's super inflexible and redoing it is super, super hard for a magnitude of reasons. Um, and so my start, my code changes, my pull request did not actually get merged into Kotlin, which is fine because I still learn a huge, huge lot about compilers. Um, so much that it probably wouldn't fit into like three or four talks. Um, so if you wanna try and tinker with Kotlin and, and just play around with it and maybe do your own changes to the Kotlin compiler, you can, Kotlin is open source and I would heavily recommend you to do it because it's such a tremendous way to learn and to grow as an engineer. It's also something very frustrating. The most frustrating thing I've ever done probably in programming, um, and I'm an Android engineer, and it's just very recommendable. So go and try it out. Here's some resources for it. Um, if you want to take a specific look at what the hell I did, uh, there's this pull request on GitHub. I will share the link on Twitter as well. Um, 
So you can also go to my Twitter profile, twitter.com slash at Yossi Wolf. And then you can take a look at the link there. Um, this is basically where I list all the, all the changes I made. Um, you can view the diff, which is very nice. Um, and there are some other resources, which I want to point you to. If you're like, well, this was kind of crazy. I'm also crazy. I want to try it. Um, so number one is the Kotlin compiler crash course by Amanda Hinchman. Um, she did a lot of, lot of write-ups and awesome resources on the Kotlin compiler. Um, most of the structure about the Kotlin compiler that I was showing to you earlier is taken um, from there with her explanations. Um, and it's super, super awesome. There are some other nice links to computer science classes, which I can only recommend. There is also the Kotlin specification, which is like more about the semantic side of things um, in the Kotlin programming language, but it also makes sense to look into if you want to do anything with Kotlin. There's my pull request. And finally, I really encourage you to join the Kotlin link Slack. There is a couple of channels, the contributors channel, where you can get information on like setting up Kotlin, building it, debugging it, um, whatever you need. There is the Arrow Meta channel. Um, Arrow Meta is a new kind of Kotlin compiler plugin, which enables you to write other Kotlin compiler plugins. It's super, super awesome. And the folks in there, it's built by 47 degrees and they know a lot of stuff about the Kotlin compiler. And if you have any questions, they're very welcoming and you can always go there and ask questions. They also hold hangouts with you if you are working on something and they help you for free, which is super nice and awesome. There's also the compiler channel, which is not as active, but still it's there. And there's some JetBrains people swarming in there. And finally, the language proposals channel, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so if you have anything that you want to change about Kotlin, I encourage you to go there because you can get some great input from JetBrains uh, people in there and other community members who are very experienced. Um, and that just makes a lot of sense for getting started. So thank you all so much for listening into this kind of, I guess, out of line talk for an Android conference. Um, it's a little crazy. My name is Jesse Wolf and you can find me and QDoc pictures and the link to the slides as well uh, on Twitter. And if you want, you can ask any questions through Slido. All right, number one, how long does it take to take, uh, how long does it take to build the Kotlin compiler from source? And that's a very good question. Um, so I guess it kind of, kind of depends on like your machine. I'm on 16 gigabytes of RAM and um, on Windows and I'm on Mac as well sometimes. And I think like building building the whole project after checking out a new branch probably takes about 20 minutes at minimum. I've seen compile times where I left my uh, laptop up in the uh, open in the hotel room um, and went for dinner and went for a walk. And then I came back after like three hours and it still wasn't done. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but really um, right now, yesterday, I was also building it. It took about like six minutes, which is fine. So if you use the Gradle cache and Gradle daemon, um, if they're reused, it should be, should be okay. So something between like six minutes and 20 minutes probably on average. Um, even though all right, I'm, I'm being told to switch to Slido. I'm so sorry. Let me do that. Um, let's see if I can get Slido to show anything. All right, great.
So even though it was not accepted by JetBrains, do you use your own fork? Actually, I don't um, because I would. There's so many changes to uh, to the Kotlin upstream. I would constantly have to like rebase and make sure everything works because I modified some kind of like you know deep-ish um, internals and this wasn't like a full implementation. There was a lot of hacks to it and I would have to do a lot more work, um, especially regarding scoping and fix some other edge cases. Um, so I don't use my own fork, sadly, um, but I hope that someday class delegation gets a redo um, and maybe, maybe that can be used as an input. How long did it take me to do all this search um, inside the compiler to implement your keep? Oh, so I started this in March, 2019. Um, and then I it kind of dragged on because it was so complicated. And I did some really intense research during like September to December, 2019. So I guess in total, I probably spent like three or four weeks of like full work time um, uh, on this. So a lot of time, uh, especially since there's no documentation. Do I know if they plan to remove the delegation feature completely? I don't have like any concrete uh, information on that. I know maybe what you're referring to is Andrew Breslov said, uh, at some point, I think Kotlin Conf 2018, that his most hated feature probably is um, class delegation. So I asked him about this, why is it your most hated feature? And his answer was, it's just so darn inflexible. It's built in a way where it's super inflexible and it's so hard to change because everything you change in Kotlin has to be backwards compatible in some kind of way. Um, doing that is not easy. Um, so they don't plan to remove it in some way um, because you know it would still have to be backwards compatible and you can't just delete it. Probably it'll just stay how it is because there's other things being done in the Kotlin compiler, like rewriting the intermediate representation. There's a lot of stuff which has to be done for Jetpack Compose to work. So they're not like planning on removing it, but I guess it's like long-term next five years or something. It's either on the find some magic solution or kill list. All right, is the JFlex lecture definition in the source code? I have never heard of JFlex, um, so I don't actually know. Uh, I know there's some enter definitions for it, um, if that helps you, but I have never heard of JFlex before, sorry. All right, so I guess that were all the questions. Thank you all so, so much for listening to this crazy talk. Um, feel free to ping me on Twitter, my DMs are open, or ping me in the Kotlin link in the, sorry, in the Android makers Slack if you're like, what the hell did you just talk about? Or if you have any questions on experimenting with a Kotlin compiler, I'm super, super happy to help. Have a nice rest of the conference.